Welcome to the supplement, everyone. I'm absolutely full to the rafters with macro at the moment and pickled with fury at the overall ignorance and befuddlement that is being shared by the media and supposedly experienced commentators this week regarding interest rates. However, I know that last week was rammed with macro and gave a good grounding. So I'm going to comment on what's happened last week. Try to keep that part a touch shorter and talk more instead about exactly what you, yes, you are supposed to do about it all rather than staying on my well-trodden high horse. Let's go to the current mortgage crisis. Yep, they went there. Again, is vastly overblown. The government have been as politically skillful as they can be by extending clemency to the small number of residential mortgages in arrears. This does nothing for those renting and having their rents being forced up because their landlords are having their mortgage payments forced up. And far more of them, in percentage terms, are on variable rates. Base rate is up to five in case you have been living sub this week under a rock. We are being continually conditioned to care about and watch the wrong metrics. Why? Let's not go full flat earth here. You can selectively control your leverage. You could also recapitalize. You can also sell. This looks like one of the very worst times to remortgage and has done for about three weeks. Margins can and really should need to fall on lending and increase on borrowing. Bank profits have been dramatically improved and margins will be rising and this is where pressure needs to be applied in order to ensure the market works effectively in full tax would have every single piece of the market puzzle answered in the same way as it was for the energy companies. There are very few differences in the logic here. Watch this space. The world has gone too far. And although it's finally realizing what some of us have known for a couple of years or more, the markets have gone too bearish with this information. It hasn't looked like the worst week to make the most of drops in various markets by purchasing and getting involved in discounted stocks and products. Uncle Warren went over the $50 BA so I'm giveaway master. The first person ever to have done so. What has the government actually done? Their first major bullet is the privilege to talk to your bank or lender without it affecting your credit score. This sounds like ball to dash to me. Scores are based on what actually happens in terms of payments, etc. Et not on conversations with your lender. So point one gets nil points. Point three or perhaps the only real point, is a 12-month repossession moratorium. This worked well and was well received during COVID, during the only thing that they really did do. Um, mostly correctly macroeconomic policy interventions. Repositions can still take place with the asset owner's consent, but not without it. It's time to wheel that old phrase out again. And it is relevant at the moment as it often is. The can has been kicked down the road. This is politically smart, presuming that within 12 months that an election will at least have been called. September 2024 looks relatively likely likely to me, so perhaps it will be extended by a further six months to buy the last pieces of goodwill from the owner occupiers in trouble. Is it going to make a big difference? Well, the government, in their own words, says the following. The latest market indicators, core UK finance, show that mortgage arrears and defaults remain below pre-pandemic levels, which were themselves extremely low. The FCA reported 86 extremely low. The FC reported essential mortgage balances in arrears in the first quarter of 2023, which is significantly lower than the 332 rate in 2009. Um, my own emphasis. But this is not the equivalent of the first quarter of 2009. Who says it is? We are not post-crisis event here, but instead living through death by a thousand cuts thanks to inflation. So what use is this comparison? The average homeowner remortgaging over the last 12 months had around a 50 loan to value ratio. This indicates homeowners have considerable equity in their homes, which makes it easier to manage repayments. Lenders have less than 10 owner-occupier mortgages on their books with loan-to-value rates greater than 75 compared to around 25 before the 2008 financial crisis. Taken together, this puts the market in a significantly stronger position than before. Once again, aggregating isn't particularly helpful 
although it is always good to know those stats. Suddenly we've gone to a 2008 pre-crisis event comparison, which looks smarter and fairer, and things stack up much better than they did after years of utterly rampant credit expansion and a booming market. Which is perhaps unsurprising. Yes, there are a couple of million households in the crosshairs. More, in fact, if the elevated rates do go on for two, three more years, then come down slowly. That's the prediction. Although that soft landing is unlikely to be what really plays out. Because real problems of the black swan, or at the very least, grey swan nature, will come along. 12 months isn't enough time to sort this, and I do have a whole raft of measures I'd be seeking to implement if I was working on policy at pro SHA and wanted to proactively make a difference. Something that was akin to the warnings on the side front of a cigarette packet. Bullet points, if you will, my style, right? Perhaps more on that next week, depending on the events of the next seven days. Who is really at risk? Those who overpaid in 2021 and took two-year mortgage to our dependency on low-timing cheap credit is what will really be at the root cause of these problems. And if we are not learning lessons about mortgage terms and pushing to seven and ten-year fixes with portability or lower commitment periods inbuilt, we have so often learned very little from our mistakes in any sort of good time. Sigh. Then you have to turn to the renters. It's fairly easy to say that the prevailing government doesn't care. Tenants don't, it's don't vote Tory a blanket statement. I'm sure some do, of course. This is the typical characterisation of the Conservative Party. I think Rishi does care, actually, as it goes, but doesn't spend as much time as he should and have the right people around him to really understand and isn't going to get that from those around him who are traditional Conservatives. However, landlord mortgages are assessed in the same way as the residential owner-occupier section above, are much more likely to be affected by what's currently going on with rates. Mark Carney, a far, far more skillful central banker than the current incumbent at the governor's office at the bank, knew this and was always worried about the volatility. Ultimately, it is easier for these borrowers housing providers to exit the market and put their money elsewhere than it is for someone to sell the family home and go into rental option. Of course, however unpalatable, it might be to anyone. The reality of what single property amateur landlords are facing at the moment is that they look at the prices they can still achieve. Even if the market is 5 or even 10 off the top of the mid-2022 market, and if the rent cannot cover the mortgage payment and 7.72 year rates, TIT will cost including arrangement, or 6.75 five year rates do not. Leave any cash flow and feel very uncomfortable, as they should do if you are entering a negative gearing situation, as I've written and spoken about before, and selling looks like a good option. This of course potentially reduces rental supply, depending on what you are selling, but selling a lot of two or three bedroom places in areas that are remotely up and coming will almost certainly hit the owner occupier market. Studio flats may well go to another investor who is simply a cash buyer, perhaps an overseas investor, so would stay in the rental market. But this is not how net positive rental units are created. This tapestry is one that sees lower rental stocks in a time of already very low rental stock. The Zoopla report from this month deserves more airtime as it raises a number of very important points but again in the interests of getting to the end without breaching the 4000 word epic word limit i often set myself that will have to wait until next week as well at the least warning i bust that limit this week but there's just so much to say at the moment i'm just going to borrow one whole line from zoopla's report we do not see a situation where rental supply is likely to expand enough to moderate rental inflation over the rest of 2023. I'd have to wholeheartedly agree with that. We need to get into mom here because that's where we will find the good news when it does finally appear month on month. Happily, really because metric blindness is definitely a thing, we can only look at four measures because we don't have any more data than that. Month on month core. Month on month core producer prices. Annualized TPI based on the past four months is 12. This is frightening, of course, but we have month on month drumming thanks to energy prices going down 17 in July, for example. Let's see the positives, though. 
Last year, April was 2.5 on its own versus this April's 1.2. October was 2 or CA1, and that inflation is falling out thanks to falling energy. Fuel prices and anecdotally food seems to be coming under control or, or at least rising a lot less quickly. We're seeking real-time info here rather than lagging annual numbers, 11 to 12th of which have already happened by the time we start a month. One more reason why the misses on the predictions are quite so unforgivable, but there we go. Annualized core based on the past four months is 13.35. That is horrific. It is worrying because these are new month-on-month -month highs. This at this time is the most worrying piece of data that there is. That's an economy that's overheating. Core will lag CPI and whilst KPI is now definitely past its peak, Core might have a couple of months to go before it does reach peak. Dropping off for the past 12 months when it comes to June's number is 0 0.4. There's faint hope in the forecasts of only 0 0.3 for June 23. But anything at forecast or above keeps Core at set if they miss the forecast to the upside again. There's a chance of 7.5 core, but a fighting chance of 7.3, 7.4 going on previous predictions. This will justify the gilt markets trading where they are or going another 10, 25 peeves even higher. The other two metrics contain better news. These metrics picked in July, um, just last year and are on the way down. This is continued good news for CPI. However, the frustration continues because what we could do with these mom services inflation data, those services inflation monster uh, driver of the UK employment market. Of course, 75 of our economy and 47 of CPI was up to 7.4 annualized for June. This is driving forwards and holding up CPI further. If you do the maths, CPI is 3.7 simply based on this one metric. And this is what a recession or considerable number of liquidations would impact in the sector. The sector isn't growing in output. It is simply prices going up and chasing wage demands to an extent. Since this number is still below private sector wage demands, more like 7.8 than the 7.4 that this hit. The most worrying thing is the upwards trend here. One more piece of relevance here is the liquidation data. May 23 continued the trend of new highs in corporate insolvencies, which all else being equal puts pressure on employment data. However, employment vacancies continue month on month drops, and this will accelerate with more liquidations. The number of extra jobs has come down around 50 if you use pandemic as the gauge. Of the 500 extra job vacancies that appeared, 250,000 of them have now disappeared, leaving 250,000 more compared to four years ago. There was a 14.5 for an increase in vacancies in the same period, 2015, 2019. You could cite a number of reasons not to look at this time period, but the financial crises had worked its way through. Brexit would be a significant factor, though, of course, of now. 2019 and 2020, we are still facing a 29.9 rise, so a little more than double a more stable time. This is how tight the labour market still is, but is trending in the right direction, ultimately. Will those insolvencies be enough to really make an impact on the labour market? Not yet, but rising insolvencies is a typical pre-recessionary sign. We are, of course, best looking at comparisons to 2019 rather than 2022. In reality, though, we should, in my view, be more concerned about the fact that we are trapped in a culture that measures the wrong things. The liberal side of the argument relies on arbitrary measures of poverty when in reality many who are in the definition of more than 20 of the median income really can't be described as living in poverty, many have safe, watertight and weathertight places to live with mobile phones and flat screen TVs. This just doesn't resonate with what the word means and in my view completely loses its impact. The same is true on the more conservative side of the argument, of course, and I worry more about the third reason to be concerned lack of skill of people in positions of power and authority to make massive decisions. Andrew Bailey, current under pressure, Governor of the Bank of England, is one of the greatest examples of this in current times. Everyone reports on inflation. They usually mean CPI, but CPI is not the most important measure. CPI is more relevant to us, including housing, shelter, costs. Core is much more relevant to everyone at the moment.
The same goes for GDP, a poor metric for growth. Where that money goes, just consider. I can potentially increase GDP quite healthily, but make 0.1 of people much richer and a good slug of the rest relatively poorer. The very same goes for base rate. Of course, those of us with any base rate tracker products do care of landlords, according to some statistics. But I suspect this is only measuring BTL products in personal names, frankly. But the very most relevant statistic is the five-year Sonia swap rate, because this is how an awful lot of mortgage pricing is done. The list of such metrics I could go on about for quite literally hours on end it is an entire presentation in itself. This is at the heart of analytics and business analysis. Watch the right things. Don't care about the wrong things. Don't worry about what you can't control. This is also exactly how you need to treat the media. I vastly prefer having a very light view of what's going on and searching out the data and the true facts that I seek and draw conclusions from them on a Sunday. And I have no plans to change that in the foreseeable future. So let us get on to what you should be doing. I've heard so much nonsensical BS this week, mostly on talk radio. I've been in the car a lot and can't stay away from it, even though I've mostly been listening to podcasts uh, about this situation. Uh, I just have to blow away a few myths. The Bank of England only has one lever. They are one-trick ponies. Technically wrong. For a start, member K and the near trillion quid injection into the treasury coffers. But much more than that, not relevant. Great stewardship here looks like regular communication with the media, calming markets and evidencing that you understand the bloody job. First of all, the total opposite is the governor's current position. As weak a leader as Boris, in my view, rates are going up, so mortgage rates will keep going up. No. Good governance here. Sees the five-year Sonia swap going downwards and thus mortgage rates getting cheaper same for the two year. The government should bail out homeowners. Come off it. Get off the bus. That expects the government to save your backsides people and sort yourselves out. It is the only way forwards. Inflation is all from the supply side. Please, please, please debunk in this argument in 2021. You just aren't looking at the facts the data, and you don't understand inflationary times if you think like this. I didn't live through in the personally as an active economic agent, but I've done the work, read through the data, and accurate historical accounts. Not I remember when the interest rate was 17 or whatever. Yawn, 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 yawn. Handouts are the best solution. Note are also extremely blunt and highly inflationary. I'm not ideologically opposed to them. As it goes, PS 900 to approx 6 million households is PS 5.4 billion. This is quite redistributive. I'm in favour of that overall. However, it is also highly inflationary. And that's why it is stupid at this time, even though it is needed at this time. It is working in direct opposition with the supposed big goal. I hate a problem without a solution. Perhaps this is the right balance, but 100 of that money basically will be consumed very quickly. I also feel the government gets no political capital for these, and that's not really very fair. But defending this administration is difficult, and I try to avoid the political side as much as possible anyway. Again, I could go on, but I won't. I want to get your actions at this difficult time. People are facing stark choices. Put rents up to market at a terrible time, especially if you have been clement on this front for many years. Otherwise, sell. Today, if properties are not yielding 6.75 net, net after operational costs, they are not viable holds. That's today. That is likely 1.125 above the range that we could easily be at within 12 months, remember, I'm talking swap rate, not base. If it doesn't work at 5.5 net after op costs, the asset needs to be moved on, sell it, hold hard for a few more weeks. The market should calm a little. The inflation news is above isn't great, 
although July CPI will come down again as a guarantee price news, and that will be somewhat helpful even if it is the wrong metric to gauge. Lenders, though, have big balances to deploy, and it will be lenders not getting their money from the swap market. It will be deposit takers and building societies really should be at the table in a big way here. Their cash balances are swelling and costing them money. They don't need two on Sonia to deploy their funds and can work to lower margins. They take less risk and have much less sophisticated business models in terms of financial engineering. They need to be faster to market, but watch out for products particularly from Paragon and skipped on building society in the next few weeks. Keep an eye on the leads too. Your broker should be all over these, if not change broker. Paragon is at about 6.5 for the moment with the fee amortized over five years. Not a terrible rate as at today. They have a pay rate of 5.4 with a fiver fee, which is currently only for porting customers, I believe, but may well be rolled out to new business for limited companies. We need a couple more weeks for the market to form again properly, assuming rates will be less volatile in the swell than the swaps market in the next month. Pay off and refinance in a while. Not the worst idea in the world. If you are comparing a basic income position, apples to apples, instead of paying 6.5, you can get a 6.5 return on your money by paying down. I operate a corporate leverage model and this is nearly unthinkable to me, but on a personal level might well make sense. Nothing wrong with it, cost time. And cash might be very useful in a full meltdown, but a full meltdown currently looks unlikely. The underlying economy is too strong and indeed that's part of the problem. Don't buy negative cash flowing assets at this time. This forces you right into high yield. Unless you are looking at a huge pile of cash you need to deploy and can buy lower yielding assets at decent discounts. It isn't the time to put financial pressure on your cash flow. This doesn't mean don't do break. For example, I don't mean negative cash flow for an initial refer period, say but I do mean low yielding properties that make you suffer from negative gearing cost of debt above net yield after operational costs. It's not the time for those. The knife is wobbling and falling a little. The old it will all make money over time. It's still true, but you must be selectively aggressive at times like this. Stay positive and tune out the noise. This is still absolutely the very best asset class out there in volume for the medium and long term. Don't worry about the short term. Keep up the positive mindset and the affirmations. Reframed, those in 2008 may remember 5.5 base rates, but five mortgage rates and three savings rates. Five year fixes on below base were not uncommon at all and some had very favorable terms. Um, banks learned their lessons on most of those, but not necessarily all. This margin rebalance needs to come back in order to make the lending market more functional. This takes time, but needs to be accelerated. Again, proper leadership and understanding from anyone at governmental or central bank level who cared about the buy to let sector. Public rental sector, and I expect no help from them, but I do expect them to try and help the tenants. Could accelerate this quite easily. But no, continuation of the same old reactive rubbish, avoiding problems and minimising workloads. Disgraceful when earning the sort of money that the MPC do, particularly the governor, bank windfall tax personally also looks on the cards as the deck hits them in the face. They are all reporting improved margins in Q1 2023 rather than trying to actually improve the market. This is profiteering at the worst possible time and should be punished by the government via a windfall tax. They should be told why this is not skill whereas the energy companies could claim some skill from the strong trading positions they got themselves into this is a bond market that has largely hit them in the face positively under a lot of the regional american banks this is almost diametrically opposed pay up and reinvest in something more useful this will also be politically expedient with the election coming up and is a no-brainer policy Labour should get ahead of this so that they can at least claim the Conservatives have stolen another one of their policies. Talking of the great man, that's where we end this week. Uncle Warren went over the $50 bin lifetime donation milestone. 
His Berkshire stock is worth about $112 BN is that today. And whilst it will drop a few by me passes, that's pretty much all going to charity too. $150 BN. And instead, most of the world spends time hating on billionaires in submarines. Go figure. Keep calm and carry on. But get on with getting towards being able to achieve merely 0.1 of what he has. And you will still leave an incredibly positive legacy that benefits humanity. Arise, Sir Warren. Until next week. Um, extra points for lasting until the end on this one, folks.